So now we turn to uh, the second time which we discuss Immanuel Kant, but of course this time specifically has to do with his political philosophy. So we've talked a lot, of course, about the Enlightenment project, the use of reason. We've seen uh, more favorable takes, shall we say, with someone like John Locke. And then we've seen a bit more pessimistic take with someone like Jean-Jacques Rousseau. We discussed slightly in that first video on Rousseau what the general Enlightenment project was. But now we're actually going to turn to that question and we're going to see Kant's answer himself to what is enlightenment. So Kant begins actually with a pretty uh, straightforward answer. He says, enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-incurred immaturity. So he is saying humans have brought on themselves this what he says is uh, immaturity, this state of relying on others. And now human beings are beginning to emerge from this. More importantly, enlightenment is not uh, just simply coming to understand more things and reading books and wow, I'm learning more facts about the world. Kant says that is not enlightenment. And the reason why we have been uh, you, uh, stuck in this state of immaturity is not from a lack of understanding, but it is from a lack of courage. And this is where uh, Immanuel Kant really breaks from other Enlightenment figures. For Kant, Enlightenment is the process of beginning to question things that one has taken for granted. And it's not individuals, but it's as a society uh, beginning to question things taken for granted. So he says, the motto of the Enlightenment is, therefore, dare to be wise. Have courage to use your own understanding. So don't just rely anymore on, oh, well, this is what the church has said, so this is what I must do. Oh, this is what my parents have said, so this is what I must do. Oh, this is what the government says, so this is what I must do. No, now you finally, uh, you know, th this people in this um, age of enlightenment finally have the courage to start questioning things taken for granted, norms, customs, um, dogmas, ideologies, and even uh, religious truths. Now, Kant gives two reasons why, uh, he, as he says, it is convenient to be immature. So the first is that elites of the past have imposed prejudices on the masses that need to be dispelled. That, of course, governments use uh, certain ideas to increase their power. The Catholic Church has done this, of course, historically. And this is something that gets ingrained down then into where you don't even have to have a government anymore telling you that this is what is true or whatever, but that it becomes ingrained into just like it's passed down from generations and it becomes second nature to you. That you no longer question these ideas. They are just obvious, common sense. So uh, he says, uh, specifically it's been what he calls the guardians. These, uh, which has actually really interesting terminology here. These people who protect institutions, that these guardians in society have actually made it dangerous by encouraging reliance on others who are uh, qualified and have already established a framework. And this actually, to some extent, is a critique of institutions themselves, that institutions have this kind of built-in drive to preserve themselves even if it turns out, you know, their existence or what they do is wrong or it's based on false premises. Now, the second reason is that he says we have, you know, after the fact that elites have imposed these prejudices uh, on, on people, that secondly, we have become docile and dependent on the regularity of authority. So once then the elites have imposed, you know, through force, through coercion, through tricks, whatever it may be, that then that mass of people has 
readily accepted uh, this power from the elites and these prejudices, such that now uh, we're dependent actually on the regularity of authority, that we don't know what to do without authority figures telling us what to do. And so enlightenment is this, um, it's not necessarily learning what is right, but it's beginning to shake the foundations upon which you assume society to rest. And there's something Socratic in this because, of course, Socrates was the gadfly going around Athens, uh, questioning people, getting them to question things they took for granted and to question whether or not they actually knew the things they claimed to know. So he says, in essence, individually, uh, this is individually attempting to enlighten oneself is very difficult because the framework the guardians have established have become almost like second nature. So it's not easy then to question because you also have to ask yourself, well, it can't just simply be a matter of questioning what you take for granted and what institutions and authority figures tell you, because what is it that you actually use to question uh, that authority? If all you have actually is that structure you, you exist within, you depend on, well, then that actually makes it very complicated. And as we'll see, there is one thing, actually, that we can rely on then uh, that gives us that courage to then question and shake the foundations of what we take uh, for granted. <clears throat> so it is reason. Reason is that uh, it is the source from which we are given the courage to question authority figures into question dogmas. It is not just any kind of reason, though. So Kant does not promote, then, that you uh, question anybody for whatever reason. He doesn't think that, well, everyone should just do whatever they think is best, and in that way, they have courage. Uh, Kant takes a much more, I don't think conservative would be the right uh, um, way to describe it, but he takes a more cautious approach to uh, enlightenment progress. So he distinguishes two kinds of the use of reason, public and private. So you might think, uh, based on this, you know, the way in which we commonly use these terms, that private reason should be absolutely free, and that public maybe should be restricted. Maybe that's in some way collective. Instead, it's the opposite. By public use of reason, Kant means the use of reason that anyone can use addressing the public. So think of it as like the town square, and you go down and you address like, oh, here's things I think about society, and you have a dialogue with other individuals, and you try to, you know, come to a conclusion about uh, if there's any problems and what improvements could be made. By the private use of reason, Kant has in, in mind that the use of reason which someone can make use of in a particular civil post or office with which they are entrusted. So it is maybe a more um, uh, specific use of reason is private reason. Uh, it involves application. Uh, to some extent, it, maybe we could use the word praxis, right? Action. And so where the public use of reason is a bit more contemplative and not necessarily associated with a role one takes on. Uh, but let me read here actually from page 55 to see exactly what he's saying. <clears throat> so Kant writes, the public use of man's reason must always be free, and it alone can bring about enlightenment among men. The private use may quite often be very narrowly restricted, however, without undue hindrance to the progress of enlightenment. But by the public use of reason, own re, one's own reason, I mean that use which anyone may make of it as a man of learning, addressing the entire reading public. What I term the private use of reason is that which a person may make of it in a particular civil post or office with which he is entrusted. So uh, he actually gives some examples here that we can look at to see what exactly he means by this and where it would be okay to use this public use of reason and where it wouldn't be okay with the private use of reason. So, uh, at the beginning of page 56 here, he says, Now, in some affairs which affect the interests of the commonwealth, we require a certain mechanism 
whereby some members of the Commonwealth must behave purely passively, so that they may, by an artificial common agreement, be employed by the government for public ends, or at least deterred from vitiating them. It is, of course, impermissible to argue in such cases. Obedience is imperative. But insofar as this or that individual who acts as part of the machine also considers himself as a member of a complete commonwealth or even of cosmopolitan society, and thence as a man of learning, who may through his writings address a public in the truest sense of the word, he may indeed argue without harming the affairs in which he is employed for some of the time in a passive capacity. Thus, it would be very harmful if an officer, so a police officer, receiving an order from his superiors were to quibble openly while on duty about the appropriateness or usefulness of the order in question. He must simply obey. So if you are a police officer and you think for some reason that, uh, you know, maybe you shouldn't do whatever your superiors have ordered that you should do, Kant is saying, you have taken an oath, essentially, and because you've taken that oath, you must, therefore, follow through with that position. Otherwise, of course, if, think back to the categorical imperative, if everyone were to question and not do what they were told when performing their job, then uh, much of the things wouldn't actually get done, and maybe we wouldn't have those jobs in the first place to do. That does not mean, though, that you remain silent. So he says, but he cannot reasonably be banned from making observations as a man of learning on the errors in the military service and from submitting these to his public for judgment. So, of course, let's take one case where, um, so what Khan is saying is that you should, if you think, well, there's a better way we can proceed doing things, follow through with the order. Afterward, then, maybe you try to have a dialogue, maybe, I don't know, get together with your fellow police officers, whatever, and you discuss, hey, I think that what we're doing is not quite correct, but this you know, other option here is better to do. And you make that open to the public so there can be some dialogue where then you publicly start to question the framework within which you as an individual and this kind of cog in a machine are operating. That doesn't mean though that like, let's say you're told to kill an innocent person, that doesn't mean you just kill an innocent person, um, because the categorical imperative would still override that uh, oath you've taken to follow orders as a police officer, of course, because um, the, the, the killing the innocent person uh, is a much greater violation of the uh, rights of other human beings as being sovereign uh, ends in themselves, as you know, being human beings that possess reason. Um, I'll give one more example here. Uh, well, I'll read from one more example that he gives. He says, The citizen cannot refuse to pay the taxes imposed on him. Presumptuous criticisms of such taxes, where someone is called upon to pay them, may be punished as an outrage which could lead to general insubordination. Nonetheless, the same citizen does not contravene his civil obligations if, as a learned individual, he publicly voices his thoughts on the impropriety or even injustice of such fiscal measures. And think about it too, this is not just, uh, it, it, Kant's not just arguing that it's a matter of, uh, you have a duty to follow through with your obligation as a citizen to pay taxes, but he's saying, yes, while you have that, you also, in a sense, by using, you know, thinking for yourself, having this courage to question the fundam some fundamental premises about, you know, maybe taxation in general. But until as a public, uh, minds have been changed about the system, you must still follow the system because otherwise the system would break down entirely. And we'll see that if that happens, then you actually won't be able to use public reason at all and you won't be able to improve uh, the situation of yourself and others. So reason, of course, plays a significant role in the Enlightenment, and especially for Kant. So reason is a kind of compass with, uh, which enables us to orientate 
our thinking. Uh, he actually likens uh, reason uh, to the Copernican revolution. Uh, I'll actually look at that quote real quick. So this would be on... Um, so this is actually from the contest of the faculties I want to reference. He says, the planets as seen from the... This is page 180. He says, the planets as seen from the Earth sometimes move backward, sometimes forward, and at other times remain motionless. But seen from the sun, the point of view of reason, they continually follow their regular paths, as in the Copernican hypothesis. Because think about the problem where, what if you had uh, everyone just doing whatever they thought was best, right? That's not what he means by having the courage to use your own reason. But instead, use reason proper, whereby you look at, well, what are universal laws which are not contradictory if willed universally? From our own vantage point, as subjective beings, in the case of looking at the stars from the Earth, from this vantage point, we can't really see any uh, you know, laws or regularities with which the planets move. But, in him, re in him referencing Copernicus, if we reorient the way in which we view uh, the universe, so recognizing that, no, the Earth is not the center of at least the solar system, right, but that the sun is, then, once we get that proper orientation, we start to see, wow, there are these regular patterns with which we can then reasonably plot out all sorts of things and predict about, you know, how comets and things like that behave in the universe. The same thing is the case with reason. So he says, to think for oneself means to look within oneself, i.e. in one's own reason, for the supreme touchstone of truth. And the maximum of thinking for oneself at all times is enlightenment. And again he says, to employ one's own reason means simply to ask oneself. Whenever one is urged to accept something, whether one finds it possible to transform the reason for accepting it, or the rule which follows from what is accepted into a universal principle governing the use of one's reason. So in the same way then, again, with the Copernican Revolution, we don't just proceed subjectively, but we proceed in this transcendentally subjective manner where, yes, we all reason ourselves, but we reason from that one thing which we all share, which is reason, the use of logic. We could... Uh, maybe, you know, if we wanted to simplify it a little bit. Now, the use of reason, though, is uh, inextricably tied to politics. That it's no coincidence for Kant that the Enlightenment, which is, right, this having the courage to use, to think for oneself, right, use their own reason, there's no coincidence that it also coincides with political freedom and the ideas of liberalism, right? Of freedom and, and liberty and, and the right to property and a constitutional government. Uh, those political freedoms and this idea of negative liberty. They are inextricably linked. Such that a high degree of civil freedom is disadvantageous, actually, to a people's intellectual freedom. Conversely, though, a lesser degree of civil freedom gives intellectual freedom enough room to expand to its fullest extent. But if you had no civil freedom at all, then you would be in the same case with absolute freedom. Why is that? Well, for Kant, it has to do with the fact that you need a framework. So Kant is, as you probably surmised, he's not someone who is just going to advocate for uh, radical democracy, and radical freedom of individuals to do whatever they will. He understands you need some kind of uh, structure without which then everything becomes arbitrary and you cannot have any kind of progress. So you need then, what he argue, uh, advocates for is a republican form of government. One which has representatives in the government, but which has a constitution and which oftentimes has a monarch, at least, of course, he lived in the time of a constitutional uh, monarchy, um, that then enables a sovereign to ensure the stability of the Constitution, but which then the Constitution ensures there's enough freedom for people to think for themselves. Because if you want to advocate for this public use of freedom, 
you need to have freedom of speech. And the only way you have that then is with a certain amount of political freedom. So what then are the political conclusions of the types of non-rational, uh, you know, public free thinking, right? If we had this high degree of civil freedom, Kant paints this out actually in a different work titled, What is Orientation in Thinking? So here Kant tries to describe the dissension that would occur with this, uh, you know, anarchic-like uh, high degree of freedom and how actually absolute freedom, if there is such a thing, um, undermines enlightenment. So, um, Kant writes, uh, Naturally enough, the result is this, that if reason does not wish to be subject to the law which it imposes on itself, it must bow beneath the yoke of laws which someone else imposes upon it. For nothing, not even the greatest absurdity, can continue to operate for long without some kind of law. Thus, the inevitable result of confessed lawlessness in thinking, i.e. of emancipation uh, from the restrictions of reason, is this. Freedom of thought is thereby ultimately forfeited, and, since the fault lies not with misfortune, for example, but with genuine presumption, this freedom is, in the true sense of the word, thrown away. The sequence of events is roughly as follows. The, uh, as he sarcastically calls it, the genius, this person who thinks they can just do whatever they want and their actions don't have to be willed universally without contradiction, the, this person, the genius, is at first delighted with its daring flights, having cast aside the thread by which reason formerly guided it. And notice he describes this uh, absolute freedom without the use of reason in a childlike manner. It soon captivates others in turn with its authoritative pronouncements and great expectations, and now appears to have set itself upon a throne on which slow and ponderous reason looked out of place. Nevertheless, it still continues to use the language of reason. So he's also bringing in the fact that um, you have to be mindful of rhetoric because one can have no substance, no truth to what they're arguing, and yet, of course, sound like what they're saying is true. Meanwhile, a confusion of tongues must soon arise among them. For while reason alone can issue instructions which are valid for everyone, each individual now follows his own inspiration. The ultimate consequence of all this is that inner inspirations are inevitably transformed into facts confirmed by external evidence, and traditions which were originally freely chosen eventually become binding documents. In a word, the complete subjugation of reason to facts, i.e. superstition, and here facts again he's using uh, sarcastically, must ensue. For this at least can be reduced to a legal form so that peace can then be restored. But, of course, uh, since human reason nevertheless continues to strive for freedom, the first use of which makes of its long, unaccustomed liberty, once it has broken its bonds, must degenerate into misuse, into a presumptuous confidence in the independence of its own powers, from every restriction, and into a conviction of the sole authority of speculative reason, which accepts only what can be justified on objective grounds and by dogmatic conviction. Now, the maxim of the independence of reason from its own need, i.e., the renunciation of rational belief, is called unbelief. For everyone must believe a, be a fact so long as it is, it is sufficiently well attested. On the contrary, it is a rational unbelief, an undesirable state of mind which first deprives the moral laws of all their power to motivate the heart, and eventually even deprives them of all authority, so giving rise to the attitude known as libertinism, i.e., the principle of no longer acknowledging any duty. Because at this point, once everyone has gone about, he's saying, um, believing whatever they want, then you start to have this kind of undermining of uh, any norms which regulate, of course, the interaction of individuals. And so notice, he's kind of arguing, 
you start to descend into this Hobbesian state of nature. At this point, the authorities intervene to ensue to sorry to ensure that civil affairs are not themselves plunged into complete disorder. And since they regard the most expeditious and forceful measures as the most appropriate, they may even abolish freedom of thought altogether and make thought itself, like other professions, subject to the laws of the land. Hence, freedom of thought, if it tries to act independently, even of the laws of reason, eventually destroys itself. So this is a bit similar, as I mentioned before, in uh, the second video lecture on Rousseau. He has a similar argument here to um, Plato and Aristotle, that eventually this kind of complete free democratic reign, do whatever you want, think what you want, uh, without any kind of uh, formal structure, that this eventually leads way to tyranny, because then authority figures come in, because people want peace and security to some extent, right? They're not willing to have complete freedom at the expense of some kind of peace and security. At least none of the, none of the political philosophies, philosophers we've uh, discussed such far think so. And so with this extreme radical freedom, this high degree, as he says, of civil freedom is disadvantageous to a people's intellectual freedom. So, the way in which enlightenment must occur then, of course, can't be something radical. For Kant, the only way a public can achieve enlightenment is slowly. Enlightenment is for him a restrained but open-ended progression. So, of course, you have on the one hand this danger of a revolution which can uh, compromise the social contract, where once people start doing whatever they want, if they have this high degree of civil freedom, well then they begin to uh, undermine some of the, the ties that bond society together. And once you do that, Kant's afraid that then the social contract collapses altogether, and then you have no guarantees about things like freedom of speech. Secondly, enlightenment must proceed as uh, a, uh, a means as much as it is an endpoint, or a process is a better word. It must proceed, proceed as much as a process as an endpoint. And the reason is that no people, as we discussed with Rousseau, no people can uh, determine that future generations must do such and such. That it must be for those people themselves, of course, to also uh, be involved in this process of enlightenment. So Kant was actually very much influenced by uh, Rousseau, so much so that the categorical imperative is actually uh, influenced from the general will, because the categorical imperative says, um, act only to that maxim such that you can uh, universally will it without contradiction, which says that, well, only do that which everyone else also could do without it being contradictory if everyone did it, which would mean you do then what is uh, rationally, you know, logical, what is morally uh, logical. And that is uh, in some way influenced by Rousseau talking about how um, freedom and authority are not contradictory if you, you know, freely submit to your own authority. And in this case, the authority would be uh, reason. And because of that, you know, we discussed with Rousseau again about how, uh, you know, you can't enslave future generations and your children. Um, so it, you can't establish laws which, you know, are to remain for a thousand years or something like that, right? Then it is each generation which must also take up this process of having the courage to think for themselves. So no age can put limits then on what can be thought or politically done on later ages. This is a constant uh, open-ended uh, progress. Now, even though um, Kant is asking, of course, this question of what is enlightenment, because he's recognizing there's something unique about the age we're living in, even though he's arguing this is what ought to be the case, is it actually, be the, is it actually the case? So he's argued, well, this is what enlightenment is, and this is how it ought to proceed, 
But is enlightenment actually occurring? Or is this just talk about some fantasy, some uh, delusion, which is not actually real? This is formulated in the question, is the human race continually improving? And he takes this up in the text called The Contest of the Faculties. So on the one hand, uh, well, on, on three hands, I guess, he, he provides three different ways in which we can think about progress. And these are importantly a priori conceptions of progress. So they are conceptions which we would consider without using uh, empirical evidence. We wouldn't look at experience. Can we just use reason alone to determine if the human race is continually improving? Because remember, um, uh, reason plays this central role in uh, determining, of course, what is morally acceptable. And, of course, in orientating ourselves in picking out these patterns, reason plays a, an important role. But can we use reason solely? Well, we've got three possibilities. On the one hand, Kant says... We have the possibility that there is continual regression. He calls this moral terrorism, that uh, continually the human species gets morally worse. And of course, um, Rousseau has argued that there has actually been moral decline, not improvement. The second possibility, the a priori possibility, is that there is a continual progression, that humanity has continually improved morally. And the third and final a priori option is that it's teleological or at a standstill. That, you know, we get better and then we get worse and then we get better and then we get worse, but we never actually get one way or the other. We just go in circles. Is there any way, Kant asks, that reason can determine whether or not the human race is actually morally improving? Well, he says, in the case of moral regression, if we were to just think about this logically, that can't go on indefinitely, or else humankind would have already ceased to exist. Because if moral regression continued, well, eventually, then humans would just kill one another because they would become so evil they would become murderous and kill one another, such that we can never even ask this question in the first place. So maybe there is continual moral improvement. Kant says, no. In that case, we would need to be the cause of our own goodness, therefore always having been good, which of course is not true, because a, uh, effect cannot exceed its own cause, and we therefore would have the power within ourselves uh, to have always been good, and that's not the case at all. So maybe we're going in circles. Well, Kant says, if true with this case, Humans would have no higher value than animals, and reason would be a farce. And of course, Kant does not accept this. He thinks that uh, reason is something pure and uh, special, which humans possess that non-rational animals do not possess. So what does this mean? We can't determine whether there is moral progress simply with the use of reason alone. However, he says, a prophetic history of the human race can't be solved directly from experience either. An absolute objective point of view is inacceptable or in inaccessible. He says, for we are dealing with freely acting beings to whom one can dictate in advance what they ought to do, right? We can tell human beings, hey, um, we can use reason to determine that, you know, this is the categorical imperative and this is what you should follow to be a good person. But he says, of whom one cannot predict what they actually will do. Because for Kant, uh, humans have free will. So he says, it is our misfortune, however, that we are unable to adopt an absolute point of view when trying to predict free actions. For this, exalted above all human wisdom, would be the point of view of providence, which extends even to free human actions. And although man may see the latter, these free human actions, he cannot foresee them with certainty, a distinction which does not exist in the eyes of divinity. So we can't, of course, uh, 
look at experience and, and empirical observation to determine whether or not there is moral progress. Now the question is, why? And the answer is that you need uh, some kind of a structure, right, like a compass to guide us then. We need signposts with which we can look to in experience, such that therefore we need both on the one hand experience and on the other reason. So this is of course part of uh, Kant's Copernican revolution himself and his um, creation of transcendental idealism, right? This combination of rationalism and empiricism. So he says, what we then must look for is a historical sign as empirical proof that yes, indeed, humanity has been morally progressing. So an event needs to be sought which would indicate that moral progress is causally active within the human race. This would be a historical sign. So we need experience on the one hand because we actually have to look back at history and we have to look at what human beings are actually doing to determine whether or not there is moral progress. But we have to know what to look for. And we can't just look at experience to know what to look for because we need something universal, something rationally consistent. So, he says, this inference could then be extended to cover the history of former times so as to show that mankind has always been progressing, yet in such a way that the event originally chosen as an example would not in itself be regarded as the cause of progress in the past, but only as a rough indication or historical sign. It might then serve to prove the existence of a tendency within the human race as a whole, considered not as a series of individuals, for this would result in interminable uh, enumerations and calculations, of course, um, but as a body distributed over the earth in states and national groups. So we must then look for one, uh, one thing which kind of transcends that single event, but which is witnessed in history, and which transcends individuals and uh, national groups, right? That it speaks for the human uh, race as a whole. That historical sign which we must look for, which is this, includes three separate signs that taken together are that historical sign. So to determine what it is which says, yes, there is moral progress, we need three things. First, we need to witness the rememorative sign. This is a sign revealing the disposition as having been present in humanity from the beginning. So it, once we see this, it would say, yeah, uh, this progression has always been there. Secondly, we need a demonstrative sign. A sign which shows the present efficacy of this disposition, that yes, it is happening. And finally, we need a prognosticative sign. A sign which will ensure that, though the value of the event may be questioned, so we might look at the event and say, well, I'm not sure that actually is that morally acceptable. It will never be possible to forget the disposition which has been revealed through that event, which would then say, it will continue in the future. So we basically need that sign that says uh, that potential has always been there. We need the sign that says it is happening. And we need that sign that says it will continue indefinitely into the future. So what might that historical sign be? We need to look for something where the reaction of the onlookers of this event uh, see great political changes in which they can sympathize with. So what is that event which Kant says proves there is indeed moral progress? It's the French Revolution. The French Revolution is that event which is not actually the historical sign, it's the event, but it is the sympathetic onlookers, those who are not involved in the event itself of the revolution, but who are sympathetic with its plights and the cause of the event itself. So let's see what he says here on page 182.
So Kant says, uh, we are here concerned only with the attitude of the onlookers as it reveals itself in public, right? Noting again, the public use of reason from discussion about uh, the question of what is enlightenment, while the drama of great political changes is taking place. For they openly express universal yet disinterested sympathy for one set of protagonists against their adversaries, even at the risk that their partiality could be a great disadvantage to themselves. Their reaction, because of its universality, proves that mankind as a whole shares a certain character in common. And it also proves, because of its disinterestedness, that man has a moral character, or at least the makings of one. And this does not merely allow us to hope for human improvement. It is already a form of improvement in itself, insofar as its influence is strong enough for the present. But I maintain that this revolution has aroused in the hearts and desires of all spectators who are not in themselves caught up in it a sympathy which borders almost on enthusiasm, although the very utterance of this sympathy was fraught with danger. It cannot therefore have been caused by anything other than a moral disposition within the human race. So, of course, we know that uh, the French Revolution is not the historical sign itself because, as we saw previously with discussion about uh, the Enlightenment and the dangers of excessive freedom, it descends into tyranny, as, of course, happened in the case of the French Revolution with uh, the dictatorship of Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, so even though, as he said, the value, right, might be bad, we can look, though, not at the event itself, but outside the event. And we can see that the cause of the event, which is the French Revolution, by seeing spectators in other countries, like in Belgium, Germany, England, and so on, by seeing that there are people in countries who are not affected by the French Revolution, but who are sympathetic to the values of the French Revolution, those Enlightenment values of uh, freedom, liberty, and fraternity, that, for Kant, is proof. That is the historical sign. Why? Well, on the one hand, it has the rememorative sign because it says uh, this has already been building up. The capacity has been there. We have the, uh, the second sign, which says that an event is taking place, and we can look at the onlookers and their attitudes. And then we can look at uh, the third sign, the prognosticative sign, and see that, yes, indeed, because we have these sympathetic onlookers, they too desire that. And because they desire that, uh, that means they have that courage with which he talked about, the courage to use one's uh, own reason, to think for oneself. But let's look at this a little bit more closely as to why the French Revolution continues the progress of enlightenment. So Kant says the moral cause at work in the, the French Revolution is comprised of two elements. First, he says, the right of every people to give itself a civil constitution of the kind that it sees fit without interference from other powers. So this is basically uh, a desire and a recognition that uh, human beings must determine, they must be their own lawmakers. So again, this is a bit reminiscent of the general will from Rousseau, of which Kant was influenced by, but is a bit more uh, specific, and of course relating to the categorical imperative in that sense of lawmaking, um, from this idea of reason. Secondly, once it is accepted that the only intrinsically rightfully, sorry, rightful and morally good constitution which a people can have is by its very nature disposed to avoid war of, war of aggression, there is the aim, which is also a duty, of submitting to those conditions by which war, the source of all evils and moral corruption, can be prevented. So, for Kant, on the one hand, we have in the French Revolution, or at least maybe not the event, which is violent itself, but at least in the, uh, 
sympathy of the onlookers, we have on the one hand this idea that they accept, right? That there is a right of every person to have a constitution and to determine the laws for themselves, right? To have representation in government. And on the other hand, that they see that war is bad, that they see that through the construction of a constitution, we can have some kind of stable form of government, which is less susceptible and hopefully for Kant eventually gets rid of war altogether. Uh, specifically, I do want to look actually at the appendix from his text, uh, The Critique of Pure Reason. In this, he writes, uh, and so I want to look at this because we can see this idea of a uh, rational constitution. So he writes, a constitution allowing the greatest possible human freedom in accordance with laws, which ensure that, that, that the freedom of each can coexist with the freedom of all the others, not one designed to provide the greatest possible happiness, as this will in any case follow automatically, is at all events a necessary idea which must be made the basis not only the, uh, the first outline of a political constitution, but of all laws as well. So in this sense, then, he's arguing we have to then, in some sense, um, use the categorical imperative, that supreme principle of morality, and actually turn that into reality, into a constitution. That, that constitution must be based on that same idea, that you have the most possible human freedom in accordance with laws that ensure each can coexist with that freedom, and that it's not contradictory. So on the one hand, then, his conception of morality is that it's uh, an ought. So morality says what we ought to do. So we ought to follow the law, the laws of reason as facilitated by politics. So morality tells us then what is rational. Politics, though, coerces us to obey reason. That co we need coercion for Kant to guarantee individuals to act as they ought for each and to find happiness in their own way. Okay, so back then to uh, this question of enlightenment. So that there is uh, enlightenment, that we are indeed living in uh, an age of enlightenment and not an enlightened age because it's a continual process. And that this is indeed happening, this moral progress is real and it will continue because we can see that uh, people are already yearning for these uh, rational, consistent laws prescribed by reason, Kant asks the question then, what sequence can progress be expected to follow? How ought we then to ensure the Enlightenment continues? Kant's answer is not uh, what might be the usual argument that it has to be from the bottom upwards, so it has to be from the people themselves. Instead, though, he says here, it must proceed from the top downwards. And the reason is, he thinks that um, progress occurs through a development of ideas in consciousness. That progress occurs through us being conscious of rational and, and correct, true uh, ideas. And that requires then education. So a people must be educated, of course, to then learn to value Enlightenment, liberal, Republican values. But this can't happen where it's a, um, a, a people-led effort. Instead, as is um, uh, the case always with Kant, there must be some kind of framework then, which is why it must proceed from the top down. So he says, the whole mechanism of education as described above will be completely disjointed unless it is designed on the considered plan and intention of the highest authority in the state and then set in motion and constantly maintained in uniform operation thereafter. And this will mean that the state too will reform itself from time to time, pursuing evolution instead of revolution, and will thus make continuous progress. So again, Kant wants you to uh, fully understand that revolution is not the way to go, but instead uh, evolution, being cautious. So on the one hand, maybe Rousseau 
is a bit more amenable to revolution. Kant, on the other hand, no, he wants a cautious evolution. Um, there's actually, I'm reminded of, in um, uh, the, the philosopher, the Slovenian famous philosopher Slavoj Žižek, in his book, First as Tragedy, Then as Farce, he writes of Kant that um, if the liberal maxim is to thank, not obey, if the conservative maxim is not to thank, but to obey, that with Kant, the maxim is thank, but obey, right? So it's both here, thank, but also obey. So uh, here's a question for you. Is humanity morally progressing, as Kant has argued, or are we morally regressing, as Rousseau argued? What do you think?